Okay. Um, yeah. So Ben, do you want to just go ahead and, and introduce yourself and, and your company and tell us a little bit about the projects that you have in mind? And then we can do a little bit of Q&A and, and discussion and kind of take it from there. Uh, yeah, sounds good. Um, so I prepped a couple of slides, which are very minimalist, uh, just for the sake of, uh, can you see them? Uh, yep. Great. All right, so my name is Ben, uh, I'm with Flip, and uh, I have a lot of project ideas for you guys. Um, I've been working in the decentralized energy space for about a year. Um, before that, I, um, I had another startup, um, which was for a, an online community for electronics engineers called Hackster. Um, and I decided to change industries because I wanted to participate you know, to the climate fight. Um, and so Flip is the company um, I founded last year. It's uh, uh, basically a virtual power plant for residential batteries. Uh, and so yes, I'd be our choice is batteries, specifically residential. Um, or small scale, we don't touch uh, good scale. So ben, can, um, I, can I interrupt you for just one sec? Um, yes, we're still we're still pretty new to the world of DERs, so we haven't really talked okay. about um, virtual power plants yet. So just um, I'll give my maybe definition, and then you can give your definition, which may be a little bit different. Yeah. But that would be great. Um, yeah. But in my mind, uh, VPPs are virtual power plants. So this is a term that people use in in the energy industry, uh, and it's basically just uh, has to do with controlling large populations of uh, distributed energy resources. So the stuff that we're talking about in this class, like solar and batteries and things like that. So um, if you're controlling one thing, it's called a DER. But if you're controlling a whole bunch of things, like the batteries in a thousand homes or something like that, then we call it uh, basically a VPP, a virtual power plant. And that name is to, meant to evoke the fact that you can provide a lot of the same services to the power grid that a large power generation station uh, would would provide. So I don't know, Ben, does yeah. that, what do you think? What's your take on what a VPP is? That's, that's a beautiful definition. Um, and, you know, I've been in many conversations just uh, pondering what the proper definition is. Um, what I like to say is that it's any aggregation of um, dispatchable assets in the sense that, you know, if it's, um, if it's solar panels, they just produce whenever they produce. Although, you know, you could turn them off potentially, which would make them dispatchable. Uh, but a battery, a thermostat, you can really change uh, how they charge, discharge, um, whether they're consuming power and all of that uh, is, is giving them, is making them pretty powerful in terms of uh, uh, providing services to the grid. Awesome, thank um, you. Yeah. And yeah, one thing I also want to note is that a virtual power plan doesn't mean that you're actually selling power to the grid. You could sell not consuming power, uh, which is called demand response. Um, and so, yeah, our, our company Flip, our focus is, isn't is only on virtual power plants. Um, it's, it's our main focus. We help uh, battery and inverter manufacturers access all those virtual power plant programs across the US. Uh, there's about like a hundred or so, um, and you know, as a as a battery manufacturer, they do hardware. They they're not very good at software. They don't know anything about good services, and so we we do that uh, intermediation. Um, but on top of that, um, you might not know yet that um, utility tariffs. Uh, so that you know how much you pay for electricity on a per kilowatt hour basis um, is not necessarily fixed anymore. You don't have this one rate. Uh, the rate might change depending on the time of day. Uh, those are called time of use tariffs. 
Um, and that's requiring a lot of those um, devices to you know, adapt their consumption or production based on the time of day. And, and so that's one of the, another one of the uh, services that we provide. We, we help sort of make this, this whole battery intelligent uh, and really reduce the cost of ownership. Um, that's about that for FIP. And now I'm going to dive directly into ideas, of which I have many. Um, they're not necessarily directly related to what we do, um, but it's the ideas that you know I've seen from my research, uh, or they're just things I think are really cool. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of start with something that's directly related to um, Flip and then I'll, I'll go down. Um, the first thing is we're about to start a project with a, a nonprofit in California um, who has helped a, a few schools um, in the um, Santa Barbara region uh, get solar and um, and batteries. Um, and they have a lot of batteries, like uh, you know, in a few megawatts. And and now that they have all of that installed, they're wondering, like, can we make money from it? Um, and what we have to do is basically do a you know look at their previous consumption in the past year. How did they consume electricity depending on the time of day? Um, and based on the criteria for, for the specific virtual power plant program that uh, in their area, um, can they make money? And can they make money without changing their current usage? Would they need to change anything? Um, and then related um, in California, uh, there's, there's been a, a recent change in, um, in rates for solar owners. Um, in the past, it was called NEM2, and it was basically, you know, you produce solar from your roof, you export that electricity to the grid, and the grid will pay you at the exact rate uh, that you would have purchased. So, you know, whether you're, you, you can, in effect, use the, the grid as a battery. Um, that changed. Now, when you sell power to the grid, you get something like 10% of, of what the electricity costs you. Um, and so for another one of those schools that doesn't yet have uh, the solar and, and battery, we need to do the same sort of assessment uh, to see whether participating in a VPP would work for them and whether it would help them um, lower the cost of, of uh, purchase. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, another thing, kind of batteries, that's, that's what I work on every day. Um, and, uh, there is a big focus on, on improving savings um, because in the end, uh, you know, consumers are concerned with how much it costs. It's, it's kind of expensive, you know, it costs maybe um, between five and 10,000 just for the battery and then you have it. Um, so it's, it's not a small expense. Um, but then with, it's like the, the NEM3 one, you might be incentivized to, you know, if you sell power to the grid, you don't make any money. Uh, or maybe you're actually interested in um, lowering your... your um, and so I think we're project um. for a number 
Go for it. And sorry to interrupt. Um, the uh, I don't know if it's the campus Wi-Fi network or if it's the internet connection. I, I'm not sure where it is, but it's a little bit slow. So I'm just going to adjust a couple of settings so that we can hear you a little more clearly. Um, can I ask maybe that you stop your your video and that other folks who are online maybe stop their video? Yes. Where is it? Okay, uh, sorry about that and, and thank you. Um, so please uh, go ahead. And actually, uh, let me just, can you maybe restart your screen share? Um, I don't think I see your screen right now. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm looking for the window. <laughs> <laughs> no rush, um, thank you. Okay. So while you're working okay. on that, I'm just gonna say a couple of things to the, to the folks in the room. So first of all, NEM, um, those initials mean net energy metering. And the idea there, it's very simple. It's if you have solar or some other energy generation source in your building, um, you get paid the same price for electricity if you ship it out to the utility uh, that you normally pay when you consume energy from the utility. So it's kind of, it's just a one-to-one -one thing. Um, and then as uh, in states like California, um, as, as more and more people have adopted rooftop solar panels, um, there has been pushback from various stakeholders against that saying, you know, for example, a utility might buy electricity, you know, at, at 1 p.m. in, in uh, you know, Southern California, they might buy electricity for like two cents per kilowatt hour, and then they would normally sell it to the consumer for something like 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So then now the price that they have to pay basically to, to get uh, solar energy from someone with rooftop solar panels might be like 10 times what they would pay from the, the bulk markets on, on the big power grid. Um, so there's you know all this sort of political and, and uh, economic renegotiation of that deal that's happening. And so NEM, Net Energy Metering 3, is an evolution from that. Um, so we, California has kind of been in NEM 2 for a long time, you know, five or six years, and now is kind of moving to a, a third version of that. So anyway, um, Ben, sorry for the, the interruption there, but um, please go ahead. No worries. Um, and so in this case, what I was suggesting is uh, depending on what the, the homeowner's goal is, whether they're trying to optimize for savings or for self-consumption or for emissions, how does it affect the other variables? So for instance, if you try to optimize for savings, how much are you going to self-consume and how many, how much emissions are you going to emit? Uh, how much carbon are you going to emit? If you try to optimize for emissions, how much is it going to cost you? And, and again, how much are you going to self-consume? Um, yeah, I think those are interesting for us to, you know, and I'm talking about Flip, to know, like to have this sort of modeling just so that when we offer optimization in the future, we know what sort of um, uh, trade-offs we're making. Um, next one is this home DR optimization. Um, right now, you know, we've got more and more devices that are actually smart, that, that have all those that are trying to optimize for uh, for savings and also to participate in, in grid programs. Um, but they're all sort of participating in, in silos. They don't talk to each other. Um, and so what I'd be curious to see is, does it matter if they're, you know, um, working in silos or would there be additional uh, savings or lower emissions if there was a central orchestration strategy. Um, so I get to say about this one. Um, the NEM3 self-consumption piece is about, uh, so it's similar to this, this home DR optimization. Uh, so as we said with NEM3, your you don't really want to export to the grid because you don't make money from that power. You're basically, um, you know, you're 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 wasting any power you don't consume. 
Uh, it's really incentivizing self-consumption. So any any kilowatt hour that your solar produces, you want your house to use it. And the question is how. Um, typically, homes will you know they will use power in the morning as people get ready. They won't use anything during the day, and then they will use more in the evening when they get back home. Um, question is, how can you move those morning and evening loads to the middle of the day when solar is producing? Uh, how can you use you know, smart appliances like heat, um, whether that's heating your house or uh, heating your water, uh, potentially your EV charger, your battery, or um, maybe scheduling other appliances like your laundry, your dishwasher. Um, how can you do that? What are the best possible strategies to do that? And I think that's that. And the last one uh, is going to be a lot more complicated to talk about. Um, but basically, DSGS is a VPP program in California. It stands for Demand Side Grid Support. Um, and what DSGS does is that it will pay homeowners with a battery for participating in uh, what's called virtual power plant events. Uh, basically, when the grid needs power because the grid is, is stressed uh, for one reason or another, usually it's just because it's, it's too hot out and people are using their AC too much. Um, they will, the, the grid as in utilities, will pay homeowners to turn on their battery uh, to both consume that power inside their homes and any leftover capacity export to the grid. Um, those happen only during the summer, because again, it's hot. And um, the trick with NEM3 is that 98% of the year, the income for selling power to the grid is very low, except for two hours a year, um, 7 to 9 p.m. in September, when the income is very high. And so the incentive for homeowners is to, just during those two hours, export as much power as they can, so that they sort of like make up for the rest of the year. Um, now, NEM3 was uh, decided upon by the California Public, Public Utility Commission, uh, while DSGS was created by the California Energy Commission. Uh, two, those two entities are sort of like the two big political entities that control everything, uh, that, that regulate the energy markets. And um, they didn't really talk to each other as the two programs were being worked on. And there is essentially a conflict between the two programs. Um, while their intent is the same, as in they both want to improve, uh, you know, make the grid more resilient and reduce energy prices uh, during, during uh, hours of stress, uh, they they used a different methodology um, because NEM3, again, the, the hours are fixed between 7 and 9 p.m. But DSGS, the hours fluctuate. So they could be, you know, it could be 5 to 7 or it could be 6 to 8. Um, and so for a homeowner, they have to decide which they participate in, which which program they participate in, uh, in the event that they don't actually overlap. And um, 
that is actually one of the, you know, like a, a big problem that we will have to uh, optimize for, for, for this upcoming summer. Um, and that's that. Uh, yeah, then I know that was a lot of jargon and, and weird uh, new concepts. So feel free to ask me any questions. Yeah, no, that's um, that's fantastic. Thank you, Ben. So I think I'll just open the floor to any any students who have any kind of clarifying questions. Um, so folks online, um, you can just jump right in and ask. And then people in the room, is, is anybody in the Zoom room in, in here? No, okay. So I think what I'll do just in the interest of convenience is I'll ask you to ask the question in the room and then I'll just repeat it to Ben. So anyway, uh, go ahead. Um, Hi, how are you? Hi. So Good yeah, you. um, thank you for the for the insights. Uh, I would like to ask you something. So you mentioned that mostly in California, I guess that all is all of these experiences uh, are basically for California. People can uh, sell electricity to the grid if they have uh, I don't know maybe batteries or solar panels in their houses. So. I'm just curious because I have seen that model before um, in my country, in Colombia, um, when you have cogeneration plants, so you can actually sell electricity to the grid, but uh, you are entitled to sell a given amount of watts or kilowatts uh, per day or per week. So basically you cannot just sell whenever you have availability but you are committed to produce a given amount of power and sell it to the grid when they need it. So they can estimate that, uh, yeah, they can they can match that need versus the demand, right? So I'm just wondering if anybody can join and sell whenever they want or whenever they have they, they have availability to sell. How how can they how can they balance the grid in that way? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So that that's actually the way it works is very similar to what you described. Um, you can only sell energy, electricity to the grid when the grid asks asks you to. So they expect that energy to be coming, um, and you know it, it's essentially this. Um, if their virtual power plant was a um, performing, what they would be using would be called uh, gas peaker plants. Uh, that's the type of plants that can ramp up in, in a matter of minutes. Uh, and those are very expensive to operate and they, they are, they're very polluting. Um, but yes, it's, it's very similar to the way it works uh, that, that you described. Got it. Thank you. Um. So, so just to add a little bit of background from my perspective um, to that question. So, um, so first of all, we've kind of learned a little bit in the first lecture that the power grid is roughly organized into the transmission system, which is kind of high voltage and high power flows, and then the distribution system, and uh, that's lower voltage and and uh, lower power flows, right? Um, and then, so economically and, and I guess politically, they're also organized differently in that the transmission system is typically run by what are called independent system operators or ISOs. And then the uh, distribution system is typically run by utilities, which are usually private companies. And um, so what we're typically talking about with these uh, power grid services um, either will be provided um, you know, from an aggregation of DERs, a virtual power plant, either to the utility um, or to that kind of wholesale um, transmission system operator. And uh, the utility, actually both of them are, are really not interested in <laughs> people who are only sm selling small amounts of power, you know, a few kilowatts here or there, because they're operating sort of at, at gigawatt scales, you know, a million times more power than that. So usually there needs to be some business in the middle that pools and collects all the DERs together in order to sell kind of their flexibility, their, their capability to provide services as a group. And that we call an aggregator typically and, and flip, I guess, is sort of more or less either is one of those or interacts with, with those types of companies. Um, 
But typically for an aggregator to participate in these um, systems economically, um, whether it's at the utility level or the distribution level, there are some expectations of reliability. Like, hey, if we call on you to reduce a bunch of demand or to soak up a bunch of excess power, you know, if there's a bunch of solar on the grid, uh, we need to you know, be able to rely on you to deliver on that promise, basically. And so if people don't do that enough, uh, eventually they get kicked out of the markets and they can't, can't participate as a business anymore. So um, I say that Xavier uh, has a question. You want to go ahead, Xavier? Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you, Ben, for taking the time to present to us. Um, so I guess similar question and more from an economics perspective, um, because in my home state of Nevada, I'm pretty sure we did away with actually paying people for generating power locally and instead opted for um, a credit system. Now, granted, there's some nuance there, right? Like we have a monopoly with NV Energy and all that. Um, but I guess hearing that California has since transitioned to um, instead of the one for one, uh, matching um, in terms of price to now 10% and then seeing what Nevada's approach, it seems like the trend is towards, you know, not giving people real monetary value for the energy that they provide to the grid. Um, and I guess, do you see any sort of protection um, of the value that the, what once was the consumer, but now is becoming a producer uh, in terms of what they can offer to the grid, it, you know, coming into play at all? Uh, or is it sort of an inevitable inevitable trend of, I guess, devaluing the <laughs> value and energy that one can provide to the grid uh, as more and more people are capable of doing so? I don't know if that made sense. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so one thing to mention is that when you pay for a kilowatt hour of electricity to your utility, uh, what you're paying, what you're actually paying for is the energy itself, but also the, the network, as in like, you know, the distribution and transmission lines, like the wires that connect the power plant to your house. Um, and uh, more and more as energy becomes cheap, you know, thanks to uh, renewable energy and, and uh, solar panels and whatnot. Um, the only cost that remains is transmission. And, and that's sort of the reason why most utilities are starting to, you know, pay very little for the, the actual energy that we produce on our roofs and want to sell back is because they still have all those costs behind. Um, and granted, I think, you know, they're, they're all monopolies, so they, they also don't have any incentive in, in paying us for that. But um, I think that that's one of the main reasons. And um, so ways to protect consumers. Um, well, one is making sure that you will use all of your power as much as possible. You know, use it on site. Don't, don't sell it to the grid. Um, so DERs can help with that. Uh, you know, automation. And um, VPPs are a great way because they, they help the grid when it needs it uh, versus, yeah, whenever, whenever your solar panels are producing, uh, which means that, you know, you have the upper hand, uh, like when the, you've probably heard about Texas, um, Texas is a really fun market because it's completely deregulated. Um, and, you know, when the weather is awful, whether it's too cold or too hot, then prices really spike up. Um, and you'll see uh, some customers making a, a lot of money from participating just at those hours when, you know, the price of a kilowatt might be 10 or $100 or more. Um, yeah. and so I think this does still an opportunity. Does that make sense? It does. And I guess just as a quick follow-up question, um, one, I, I was in Texas for the, the great freeze. So I definitely got to experience mm -hmm. that firsthand. That, that was yeah. <laughs> interesting. Um, but would you consider then like community scale microgrids sort of a threat to the business models that are being developed here? 
uh, our community scale microgrids a threat to virtual power plants? Yes. Mm. It could be. I mean, if I haven't really thought of that uh, like that. But if you imagine the microgrid really being islanded and not necessitating, not requiring any power from the grid, um, then sure. One thing about the community scale microgrid itself is that you know there will need to be some form of power transaction between between homes. Uh, you know, if it's it's sort of the same as a large scale grid, but you know like say 20 homes, 100 homes. Um, and it might be that some homes, maybe all, imagine all homes produce the exact same amount of power. Most likely some homes will consume more power and some homes will consume less. And so they will have to transact energy between one home and the other. Um, and it's, it's a pretty similar model in that respect. Gotcha, thank you. I guess I would just add to that that um, so typically so a microgrid first of all is just like a small power system. Um, so if you think of like a, a ship or an airplane, it basically you know it does the sort of same thing that a, a big electric power grid does, but just at a much smaller scale. So typically you have generation, you have some form of storage, and then you do balancing of, of supply and demand internally. And um, a microgrid typically can operate either in what's called islanded mode, meaning it's totally disconnected from the electric grid. So like a ship out to sea is, is in an islanded mode. But they also can operate in what's called grid connected mode, um, where they do plug in to the bigger power grid. And to, so Xavier, to your question there, I guess I would say that in the grid connected mode, which is typically the normal operating mode for microgrids, although it's definitely valuable to be able to switch into islanded mode, for example, during a power outage, um, but when you're in grid connected mode, really the microgrid operator kind of is a virtual power plant, right? They're they're coordinating internally, you know, energy storage and and uh, generation and potentially flexible demand and things like that. So I think a lot of the stuff we're talking about for VPPs, I think, is also very relevant um, for for microgrids. Understood. Thank you. Let me uh, see if anybody in the room here has a question. Yes. So to follow up on that, do you have any idea or information about how like real are so the question is how prevalent real microgrids are. Um, that is a good question, and I don't personally have stats on it. Um, although I think Xavier actually is uh, either has a business or is starting a business in that area, so it may have a little bit better market intelligence for us. I don't know, Xavier or Ben, do you want to take a stab at that? Uh, I don't have any stats readily available, um, but they are growing in popularity. Uh, I can say that much at least. Oh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, are the um, is there like a cost benefit, or is it primarily like resilience? So the question is: Is there a cost benefit, or is it primarily resilience? Of course, that's a cost benefit too. But yeah, but like avoiding power outages and things like that. Um, I have a take on that, but let me I'll let some of the other people on the call talk. So does anybody want to give an answer to that? Are microgrids primarily about cost reduction or about resilience? From what I've seen, and this is sort of anecdotal and you know, my experience as it relates to business for this, um, the 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 bigger cell is resilience. Uh, but you know, the the cost perspective, like cost has been framed. Or I should say, sustainability has been framed in terms of cost, um, but the actual like value proposition has been resilience. Yeah, that that makes sense. I guess that would match my intuition as well. So where you see a lot of microgrids today, and actually this is not a new thing; it's been around for hundreds of years. But would be a place like a, a hospital, for example, where you have you know people who are on basically life support, and if the power goes out, you know terrible things could happen. And so you find you know in Hurricane Sandy in in New York, whenever that was, 2016 or something like that, some of the places that didn't lose power basically were were hospitals that had their own backup generators and their own capability to sort of disconnect from the grid and provide their own power. So that is like purely a resilience thing, right? It's really not about the, the savings at all. But 
as you know, if you look at places where um, prices are getting higher and higher, like um, Hawaii, for example, they import essentially all of their energy as as fuel oil from tankers. Um, not all. Now they produce a, a significant amount from solar and from hydroelectricity on the islands and stuff. But um, in Hawaii, you know, electricity is probably a factor of three more expensive than it is here in Indiana. And so there, um, kind of things that would sound crazy here become economically viable on, on a cost. Uh, not even set, uh, thinking about resilience benefits. So there are folks who, you know, just based, basically based on economics would want to disconnect from the grid and, and run their own, you know, solar battery, et cetera, microgrid. So. Okay, another question from the room. I have a question with uh, what you're talking about density. Uh, I read that in a lot of European countries, they're doing away with this and entirely moving to something called growth meeting, where all of the energy is exported. And uh, especially for a home with not a lot of usage, that makes a lot more sense because let's say the German government is uh, remunerating them at a much higher rate compared to what California is doing if they send all of their electricity. So do you think that's a better option compared to what's happening in California now? Okay, so that uh, that's a nuanced question. So let me try to paraphrase it as best I can. And then if I get something wrong, let me know, okay? Um, but the question basically is in the discussions of net metering, um, in some places in Europe, they're considering something called gross yes. metering, where basically just everything is exported. So there is no self-consumption, yes. is that right? Yes. Um, and then uh, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Yes, is it's that right? Smaller homes where there's not a lot of usage and you might have to sell a lot of electricity, it's okay. a good idea to just move entirely to that. Okay, so especially for smaller homes where you don't have a lot of demand, but maybe you have a lot of roof area and so a lot of solar. Yeah. For a smaller home like that, is it a good idea to move over to something like gross metering yeah. from net metering? Um, ben, let me kick that one to you. Did you understand the question? Yes, I understood the question. Is, is that also the case in Hawaii, I think? I actually don't know about that. I'm, I'm not sure about Hawaii's current net metering arrangement. Um. But regardless, if uh, I'm not extremely familiar with that, but in the in the case where the energy is paid at uh, you know one to one rate, if you're exporting it completely, or maybe maybe you're getting paid uh, I don't know like seventy five percent of it. I think it it does help to be able to just export everything. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that, that's just a way to reduce your bill. And it's very straightforward. You don't have to, uh, one of the things, you know, like in, in the U S or in the, in the current system, they will have to size your, your solar panels based on how much you consume. Um, in California, there's actually, uh, I think it might've changed, but it used to be that you could only produce uh, from solar 150% of, of what you consume. Um, but in the case of gross metering, it could be that you can just generate as much as you as your roof can um, you know, support, uh, in which case in places where they don't have enough generation, it could be very beneficial. Uh, especially a yeah, way to sort of like kickstart uh, new new systems. Uh, so I think yeah, um, and and one of the things is that every every place is different. Climates are different. Um, you know the economics are different. Utilities have different roles, um, and so something that might work there might not work here. And. Uh, but that, that sounds pretty good to me. Okay, thank you for that. Does that address your question? Yeah. Yep. Are there any uh, like overarching grid organization strategies that I don't know, are like generally agreed on? Like this would be better if we could do it in the way that like for climate change, but we need to have less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's like how, how you get there is very you want to split like goal needs to be the, like everybody agrees on the goal. Is there such a thing, group-wise? 
Okay, so um, another question from the room here is, and again, paraphrasing, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so we all kind of agree on the big goal of decarbonizing, or most of us do anyway, not, not everybody, but, um, and there's kind of the way that we do the grid today, which, you know, in some ways getting things like DERs to participate in today's grid feels a little bit like, you know, slapping patches on an old system, something like that. So is there a vision for a better way that the grid could be operated that's kind of more more naturally integrates these new newer technologies? And then the even if it's just a like, very high level strategy, like if everybody was microgrids or something like that. Oh, right? sure. Yeah, even if it's just a, a a high level strategy, like maybe everybody has their own microgrid and then we all kind of loosely interconnect or something. I don't know. Uh, ben, any thoughts on that? Are you asking if like the, the federal government has or has been working on, on this sort of, uh, you know, national plan or? Yeah, I, I think, is there a plan, whether it's from the federal government, maybe, you know, or is there a plan from researchers or from business? Um, so, for example, I think about uh, New York State's uh, REV initiative, right, reforming the energy vision, which was about kind of more or less breaking up the monopoly utilities that, that work at the utility level and turning them into kind of market providers for companies like like uh, VPP aggregators and stuff. So, I don't know, Ben, what what what's your take on that? Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with plans like that or even the one you just mentioned. Um, I know that the Department of Energy really loves VPPs. They did put out recently a, um, a report called the VPP Liftoff, um, in which in which they uh, identified a bunch of challenges and you know, they were sort of asking the industry to uh, to solve them. Um, and they're doing something similar with interconnection. And, you know, one of the big challenges here is that we're working with regulated monopolies, uh, utilities, and uh, their touching, touching their market, uh, they, they have a lot of power and they will do anything in their power to prevent regulators to to touch the market and um, that's that's sort of what that sort of plan is so uh, yeah yeah, yeah certainly a certainly a, a thorny issue right the kind of political organization of all these um different stakeholders um so and by the way i i love that um department of energy report and i think we'll read that or at least excerpts of it um in a later portion of this class as we kind of move past some of the technical material and into more kind of a social and economic context. Um, but I think in the interest of, of time here, Ben, I wanna be respectful of, of your time. So I'm just gonna ask maybe a couple of you know, rapid fire clarifying questions about the projects. And then maybe I would suggest that uh, if it's okay with you, I'll share your contact information with the students. And then um, they're kind of in the process of figuring out what they wanna do for projects. And so if they want uh, to talk with you, you know, on a follow up kind of thing, is it okay if they reach out to you maybe via email? Uh, yeah, that's that's totally fine. It's um, it's just Ben at flip.energy. Okay, easy enough. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll share that on Brightspace with you guys as well if you didn't catch it. But um, okay, so just a, a quick summary of what I understand from project number one here. So are you already working with nonprofits and schools in California? Like, is that part of Flip's current business? Uh, it's not our current business, but there is a specific project that we are... Um, that we're currently exploring with uh, a few schools. Okay, cool. And then, um, so the idea is they're already putting in things like solar batteries, maybe smart uh, electric vehicle charging, something like that. And we'd like to understand how much, basically how much money they could make from that. Is it worth it for them to kind of form a VPP and, and sell some of that service? Um, yes. Is that a fair summary? Okay. 
And then on number two, it's kind of investigating these trade-offs. So we'll learn about how to control and coordinate and orchestrate DERs, uh, populations of them and individual ones. And so that second project, as I understand it, is kind of about you know, when you're doing that co coordination, what are the trade-offs between money that you save um, and, and like the emissions that you reduce and, and things like that. So depending on maybe a stakeholder's priorities, if they really, really care about the environment or if they really, really care about their pocketbook, you know, what should they do and what are the trade-offs between those things? So is that a fair kind of characterization of number two there, Ben? Yeah, that's right. And and the self-consumption piece is uh, a lot of people, you know, just want to be Oops, I think we lost your your audio there. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. I just I just stopped I just stopped talking. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, sorry about that. So, like, people just want to be independent. They want to be self-sufficient. They want to use their own solar that they produce, basically. So, yeah. Yes, I, yes. Okay. okay, great. So, investigating those those trade-offs. Um, yeah. Okay, and then kind of trade-offs between sort of looking only locally, only at what's happening in your own building versus, you know, coordinating um, maybe in some optimal fashion with a bunch of buildings. You know, what is the money that we leave on the table kind of by just doing our own thing in silos? I guess that's number three. Um, uh, yes, and and it's it's even more granular than that. It's uh, you know what happens if your water heater and your thermostat work independently, and what happens when they work together. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, we actually have research projects on, uh, currently um, on that right now. But um, yeah, I love that idea. Okay, cool. Um, that's another good one. And then sort of number four and number five to me seem a little bit related. Um, mm -hmm. So this is kind of looking, so if a group wanted to tackle one or, or maybe both of those projects, it would be kind of looking at the details of how this new law in California, which again is kind of the leader in, in terms of solar adoption in the United States, um, how this new law has affected things like um, incentives to sell electricity out to the grid versus to kind of shift your demand around and uh, consume your solar power locally. Um, and then I guess number five is that one, it's kind of looking at are there clashes or conflicts between the sort of net energy metering three versus um, this demand side grid support? Um, or is it sort of just looking at the decision, kind of the design problem? Like if you're uh, a person who has a certain mix of DERs in your house, maybe you have an EV, but no solar, um, is it better for you to go NEM3 or to go DSGS? Is, is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think you could play with a lot of different scenarios. Uh, and see what works for who, you know, depending, yeah, just like you said, what do they have in their house and uh, um, what makes more sense. Okay. All right. Well, you've certainly given us a lot, uh, given a lot, uh, given us a lot to think about and to to talk about. So we will go through some of these things, and then I expect that um, some students will probably reach out to you maybe for clarification. So. Um, yeah, really appreciate you taking your time, the time to meet with us. And again, students, um, you should please feel free to reach out to Ben um, on your own if you want. Sounds good. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the class. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, let me stop share for a second here. Um, okay, so um, where we are going from here, uh, <laughs> I just want to basically go back to the, the slides that I presented last week, Thursday. And um, you may remember that we wrapped up by talking about uh, policies for charging electric vehicles. And there are various kind of clever ones that you could do kind of at the level of one vehicle or at the level of a whole population of maybe thousands of vehicles. Um, but for now, we'll just be talking about sort of the EV charging strategies within um, for, for one car. Um, and I just want to go through those. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the mathematical details of how the strategies work, although you may want need to program one or, or more of them um, for next week's homework assignment, which, by the way, I'll probably put that up on uh, tomorrow, most likely. Um, yeah, but I just want to show you kind of some graphs and figures of, of how those charging strategies can look. 
Um, but before we do that, does anybody have questions that they want to talk about? Um, now that Ben is offline, we could discuss kind of internally. Okay, I guess we're all I guess we're all good there. Okay, so, um, right, so the first charging strategy that I wanted to talk about, um, following up on what we did last week, uh, is basically the, the simplest thing. It's kind of what, um, you know, like a, your phone might do when you just plug it into the wall. And the idea is basically, okay, as soon as you're, you're plugged in, you just start charging full blast, and then you stop when the battery is full. So again, I'm not going to go through the mathematical details here, but it's fairly straightforward to, to write the equations down for that. Um, the second policy would be, okay, don't just charge all the time, right? So even if you're plugged in, don't just automatically start filling up your phone. If it's at 95%, right, who cares? Um, but wait instead until you get below a certain threshold. So maybe, you know, you make a decision when you go to bed at night, you know, based on uh, how much uh, charge you have left in your phone battery, do I want to plug it in and charge to 100 or do I want to leave it? You know, if I'm at 80%, maybe I leave it for a couple of days, something like that. So here, the idea is that you have some user-specified threshold, uh, X minimum, that's what the underline here means, and it might be you know 40% or something like that. And then you basically only charge uh, if you get below that threshold, and when you do, you just charge full blast until you're full again. And then the third one is, um, again, so wait until you're below a certain threshold, but then rather than charging full blast, uh, you say, okay, I've got not just a sort of a, a desired amount of energy from the user, but also a desired time, a deadline when you want that amount of energy. So for an EV charging app, for example, it might let you enter, I want 80% energy by 8 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning. And maybe I plug my car in at 9 or, or, or 10 p.m. And so there's you know a fair amount of flexibility in terms of what hours I choose to charge in and how hard I charge during those hours. Um, so the idea here is to kind of spread that charging out um, over all the hours in which we're plugged in so that we end up basically just with the desired amount of energy at that deadline. And the equations here are, are slightly more involved, although the end equation is, is really not too bad and it's something that takes a line or two of code to write up in, the, in MATLAB or Python. So I, I don't want to go through those details again. I just want to show uh, an example of what those strategies can look like. So um, here I'm plotting essentially the input data for, um, for this example. So uh, we're going over a five day time span. Uh, we run from hour zero here, which is just a, a random day at midnight, um, all the way through midnight on the fifth day. And then uh, the amount of uh, what I'm plotting here on the Y axis is the amount of power uh, that's being discharged for, uh, for driving. So the shaded periods in these graphs are, are, are periods where the car is plugged in. And then the white periods are, are periods when the car is out and on the road um, or maybe in a parking lot, but anyway, it's not plugged in uh, at home. And so the, the small uh, little bars here are basically short trips. And then the big uh, taller bars are, are longer trips. So the longer trips not only use more energy, but they also use more power. The uh, idea here is that like kind of there's more or less two modes of driving. You're either on kind of slow city streets for shorter trips or you're on highways for longer trips. And so uh, the, the speed and therefore the discharge power is, is higher during those highway trips. And then I'm modeling a battery with 80 kilowatt hours of energy storage, kind of a big but not huge battery. And then, um, oops, I said seven days here, not, uh, not five days. So yeah, it, it is seven days. And we talked about how this parameter what I, that I'm calling alpha, which is the energy intensity of driving, we talked about how that actually varies with lots of lots of things. Like, are you driving up and down a bunch of hills? Uh, is it hot or cold outside? You know, and, and other stuff. But here, for simplicity, I'm just using a fixed value of 0.3 uh, kilowatt hours per kilometer, which is kind of, I don't know, mid-range or maybe a little bad, I guess. And then, um, yeah, so right, the shorter trips are and longer trips are at different speeds. So this is what that policy number one looks like. Um, so basically, again, anytime we're in one of these gray shaded areas, um, well, that means that we're plugged in. And so this first policy just kind of naively says, okay, charge full blast. And so here, even though we're at you know 60 kilowatt hours, still probably plenty, um, we charge all the way up to full. 
And then it's a little hard to see unless you zoomed way in on the x-axis in the second plot here, which is the, the charging power, the power that we're putting into the battery. Uh, but you can see that there's a little bit of usage here during the gray period um, before it goes all the way down to zero during the white period when the car is unplugged. So that basically is the fact that there's a little bit of self-dissipation in the battery model. So it's losing you know, a fraction of a percent. And then it basically, the next time step charges back up um, that, that fraction of a percent. And then, yeah, so we go on a big driving trip. So if I flip back, there's a tall um, usage here around hour, maybe 45. And then we can see we plug in after that um, around hour 48, something like that. And then we use um, a lot of power in order to drive the battery all the way back up to the full capacity. Um, and I've drawn what I, I've simulated here is basically 50% charge is the sort of minimum threshold that the user, the driver wants. And this policy does not use that information at all, right? Whether we're above or below that, it still just recharges full blast. Um, and then our power up policy number two, it does take into account this minimum energy, the X min. And so you can see that even though the car is plugged in and not at full charge here around hour number 20, um, we don't charge at all. So if we look at the, the bottom plot, we're still at zero through that whole period. And it's only when we drop below this 40 kilowatt hour that the user wants that we charge. And then when we do charge, so I'm modeling here level two charging, which has about a 12 kilowatt um, limit. So we charge at that full blast and we're not covering the full gray shaded area here. We're only charging for maybe half or, or over here, maybe three quarters of the time. And the rest of it, we basically just turn off. So does that one make sense? Questions about that strategy? Okay, and then the third one, again, fairly simple, but it, it looks a lot like policy number two, but rather than charging at full, the full 12 kilowatts of capacity, here we charge at sort of whatever the minimum capacity is that we can charge at in order to basically meet the, uh, the, the energy, desired energy state at the end here. And here I'm saying the user wants the full a full battery basically in the so, um, so during these plugged in periods, we charge at just a constant power and the value of that constant, uh, it changes depending on sort of how long uh, the user has to charge and how low the battery is at, at the beginning of the charge period. So here the battery was quite low. And so we charge at a high power for the full, maybe eight hour evening, but here uh, the charge is a little bit higher, maybe 30% rather than say 10%. And so we can charge a, a lower value. And so you can imagine this is going to place different sort of stresses on the electrical wiring within the house or, or the building that this thing is charging in. But also, if you imagine, you know, a thousand of these cars doing this behavior, the overall load profile might look quite a bit smoother and less peaky than a load profile you would get, for example, um, from a thousand cars doing policy number two, where maybe they all start charging at the same time and they all charge full blast. So... Um, I think for this homework, we'll probably only have you simulate one uh, EV, but uh, once you know how to do it for one car, you can pretty easily write a for loop or, you know, um, some vectorized, uh, you know, code in MATLAB and, and simulate a whole bunch of cars. So, um, so that may come up on, in a future homework or, or project. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to say about that. Let me ask if there are any questions about this EV charging stuff. Yes. I'm just trying to think this up on the fly, but... Mm -hmm. How does this compare with like people's gas fill-up strategy? So how does this compare with gas fill-up strategy? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And really one of the uh, one of the really cool things about driving an EV versus a gasoline car is that your home kind of becomes the gas station, right? So people's gas strategy is usually like drive until you get low, pull over and fill up. Um, but here you can, you know, top off every night if you want to and just, you know, rest assured that you're always going to have sort of as much energy as there is. Um, there is another dimension to EV charging, which is the sort of on the road EV charging. And um, and that it, it's an active area. There's a lot of money um, at the federal level, state level, and so forth for basically supporting either utilities or, or private companies to build out charging stations and so on. Um, but if you like I don't know, my father-in-law just bought a Tesla. <laughs> and so Tesla has the smart charging app where you can plan out your route, um, just like you would in Google Maps or something like that. And say you're driving, you know, 300 miles or something like that. It will change your route, um, not just from the fastest one to get from point A to point B, but also to go past charging stations kind of at the appropriate times. Um, and it turns out that EV batteries charge faster uh, at certain percentages of, of their battery uh, capacity. So like when they're close to full, they charge pretty slowly. 
And when they're close to empty, I think for the safety of the battery, they usually reduce the rate that they allow it to charge at. But then there's this kind of middle range, sort of 20 to 80% battery life um, or battery capacity where they can charge super quickly. So if you go to a, a Tesla fast charging station, you can charge at like some ridiculous uh, rate, but, but only kind of in that sweet spot. So you get these weird routing things where you're going on a road trip and at every 50 miles, it has you like stop and top off, but only for two minutes and then get back on the road. <laughs> so, um, so that stuff is very, like, I think it depends a lot on um, the profile of the battery, like what's healthy for it, um, how, how quickly can it charge? What does the, the network of charging stations look like? Um, are you in a densely populated area where there's a charging station every five miles or like, you know, is it a little more sparse like Indiana, for example? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so I think these things vary uh, significantly. And then, of course, there's some interplay. Um, so if I have access to easy roadside charging stations, I might not worry so much about charging at home, knowing that I can just pop up, you know, into the, the charging station on the way to work or whatever. Or if there's an EV charging station, you know, at school, you might drive to school, park, and then charge there rather than charging at home, something like this. So these things vary a lot um, from person to person, from driver to driver, and it's kind of in flux. I think that it's kind of, you know, depends a lot on, on the availability of charging stations and, and so forth. But does that address your question? Ish? <laughs> okay. Cool. Yes. Uh, with different how much energy are we using on the so that's a good question. So the question is, um, for the three different policies, um, how much energy are we using in the three of them? And is it significantly different between the three? So um, so I don't have that number, those numbers in front of me, although I could pull up the MATLAB code for this. Um, but so if we just look at the area under the curve um, for the second plot, basically the area under the power curve is the energy. So if we look at that area, just eyeballing it, it looks pretty similar, certainly between policies two and three, I would say it looks exactly the same, right? Uh, they're just rectangles. One is a little taller, but narrower. The other is a little wider. Um, so there, I think that the energy is not the primary concern. I think the primary concern is really what the power profile looks like. Um, the idea being that things like, um, you know, the, the electrical components that make up the power grid. So things like power lines, uh, transformers, um, and, and so forth that they, they all are rated for a certain amount of current, which at a fixed voltage basically translates to a certain amount of power. Um, so if you have you know, really high peaks in the power consumption, that can it can basically heat up wires or the wires that are inside of transformers, stuff like that. And so if they're too hot for too long, those components can fail. And so shaping the power signal is kind of about protecting that stuff. And so that's one of the main values, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but we'll learn later in the class that that's one of the main values that DERs can provide, or rather smart coordination of DERs can provide, is basically, you know, kind of, you can think of interleaving the power profiles of a bunch of different devices so that the overall power is kind of smooth and nice uh, as a way to protect that electrical equipment and then avoid, you know, having to have the utilities spend a bunch of money and take a bunch of time uh, to basically replace all that equipment. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Thanks for the question. Yes? For um, just to clarify on policy three, so if we're trying to meet the deadline, then I think last class when we were talking about this, we said that like it was physically impossible to meet the deadline. It would just charge it full full blast and just get as close as possible to that before the deadline set deadline. That's right. Yeah. Um so the question, sorry to paraphrase for folks on Zoom, is um in policy number three. What if like the user set an, an unachievable deadline? So their battery is totally empty and they say in two hours from now, I want it to be totally full and you just can't charge that quickly. So yeah, the, the way that I've written out the equations for policy number three um, basically would uh, in that situation would charge full blast. And so um, here, here the, the minimum operator basically takes the smaller of two things. So if we imagine the, the right-hand side, the, the right-hand side argument here is basically what the user wants in terms of a charge rate. And then the left-hand side is basically the maximum that you can deliver. So here, if, if the max we can deliver is like five and the user is asking for like 20, we just give them the five, <laughs> basically. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, so any other questions about this material? All right, so I think you guys probably will get to play a little bit more with uh, an EV problem in the homework. Um, and I think the, the next homework format will be similar to the first homework, which basically is like a little bit of pencil and paper work, hopefully not too difficult, um, but you know, to 
give you a sense for the equations that we're working with and stuff like that. And then um, more of the work will be kind of getting um, uh, getting a, a coding problem right. And I think I'll probably keep going with the general framework where I give you kind of much of a code or a wrapper script, and then you write kind of functions that do you know, the, the hard pieces, the simulation or the optimization later uh, in the semester. So, um, okay, I had a couple of things that I thought I might wanna just chat about, um, kind of logistical things today, just to wrap up in the last five minutes or so here. Um, the first uh, is finding teams to, to work on the homework and, and projects on. So you don't have to work with a team if you don't want to. If you'd rather do your own thing uh, on homework, that's fine. And for projects, that's also fine. Um, but if you do want to work in a team, we want to facilitate that. And in particular, we have some students who uh, aren't in person at all. They're online students. And so we want those folks to be able to plug into your teams too, if they want to. So I think what we're going to do for that, or at least my first cut of a solution for that, um, that's kind of a, a matchmaking exercise, is we have created a, a Google Sheet that basically helps with forming teams. And, and there are two tabs in this sheet. There's the class roster tab, and then there are project teams. And there's nothing in the project teams yet because um, nobody really knows yet exactly what they're going to be doing. Um, but the idea here is, you know, you pick one that's, okay, maybe this is uh, looking at net metering policies in, in California, uh, like Ben from Flip proposed. And so maybe, you know, a team of three forms, they want to do that. And so you basically claim that, that topic and multiple teams can do the same topic. That's fine. Um, and then you put down the, the team members' names. It could be two, it could be three, it might only be one person. That's fine too. But then the idea here is, um, you know, we have everybody's name in the class. We also have their emails. Um, so if I just look at, at my student Nada, for example, she might say, I'm looking for a team. And then she would tick this box. Uh, and she might say, I already have a project team. I already know what I'm doing there, but I am looking for people to work on homework with. And so then the idea is, you know, if you, um, so just to pick on my other student, uh, Arush here, maybe both of them are, are looking for people to work on homework. Uh, together, um, and that could be here in person, or it could be, you know, on Zoom or whatever. Um, they can both check those, and then they might send each other emails saying, "Hey, you know, um, maybe we should work together," or whatever. And then, um, similarly, if you're looking for a, a class project, um, you can come through and, and you can tick that box, and you can add a little information. You can say, oh, "I'm I'm really really excited about EVs. Like, I, I want to go to work for a car company, and I really want to help Ford do better EV charging, you know, code or whatever." And so you might look for other people who have overlapping interests and form a team in that way. So um, this is a public, uh, publicly editable thing. So I would ask you um, first to check that your name is okay. I just kind of copied and pasted it from the Purdue online thing. And I'm sure that there are some uh, errors in here. So, so if you could check that, that would be great. And then, um, yeah, just kind of fill this stuff out with whatever is relevant for you. So any questions or, or suggestions about that? I guess you can also, maybe this is, it could just be like a notes section. So you may, may also be in a situation where you have two people on a team and you want a third person who has a different skill set. And you, you could say, you know, we're looking for somebody who's really good at thermal modeling, for example. So um, we, we just talked about that. Uh, a couple of other uh, students from my laboratory, um, not from my research group, but guys who work more on kind of automotive applications, but want to work on more of a thermal kind of a buildings type application. So they might have really good skills at, at control or optimization already, but want a team member who's really good at thermal model, uh, for example. And so, it, you know, you could put that in the sheet. You could say looking for somebody with thermal modeling expertise. Yes? Yeah, so, okay, the question is about Python versus MATLAB for the homeworks. Yeah, right. So I said this early, so that the com comment is that the starter code that I gave on GitHub is MATLAB, not Python. Um, so, okay, so in a future version of this class, I would love to support MATLAB, Python, and Julia. Um, but I, I said this early on in, in day one that, that the staff is only going to support MATLAB this semester. Um, and that's basically just to keep things manageable for, for our lives. <laughs> okay, so I recognize that that's not ideal for everybody, and some people would prefer to work in Python. And so my thought on that is that that's okay. Um, but again, like the class staff isn't going to support that directly. So if you go to office hours, you may or may not get help. And the starter code that I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give both a MATLAB and a Python version. So, you know, everything that happens in that starter script for this week's homework, you can do in Python, right? 
Um, so Python has uh, ODE solvers, just like MATLAB's ODE 4.5. So if you, you know, if we Google um, Runji Kata ODE Python, we probably get the, the script that does this, right? Runji Kata fourth order method to solve differential equations. So, um, so, so this is essentially what um, the first part of problem number three is asking for. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be a heavier lift. So, so I guess my, it's, it's up to you, but so kind of two paths. One is you could stick with Python and you could essentially try to port stuff over. Um, and, and that'll be a little more work, but you'll probably learn a bit of math, MATLAB as you're doing it. So it might be useful. And the other is like, just take the plunge, rip off the bandaid and, and just move to, to MATLAB. Um, now it might be a really good idea to work with a friend who's a, a MATLAB expert so that you can be like, look, here's the Python syntax that I want to do. Can you show me how to code this in math? Right. So look, I, I know that's not ideal, but does that make sense at least the, the policy? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions or comments? All right. So I think I had a couple other topics that I wanted to talk about. Um, Oh yeah, just talked about uh, this week's homework basically. And then from there on, the, the rest of it doesn't really, really matter. Um, but let me just see what I have in there. Yeah, um, we have like two minutes left, but does anybody have a quick question about this week's homework? Um, I'd be happy to field it. Yes. So the submission for the universe of MATLAB should be like just copy pasted, but into a word document in some of it, or do you want like a MATLAB script that you want? So, so how to basically submit your MATLAB code for um, for problem number three? So my suggestion there, um, and and by the way, there may be other ways. So please feel free to answer um, other folks in the room. But my suggestion basically would be uh, take a, either a screenshot. I mean, so eventually you're going to upload upload basically one PDF that has all of your homework answers in it, the handwritten or, or the tablet written stuff and the code. So I would say you know take a screenshot and then insert it into the PDF. Um, something like that it's probably easiest yeah. does that work for you okay any other suggestions of how to do that better yeah, you, can just, you can also just like publish the matlab code and just combine pdfs oh that's fair so if you do matlab if you do publish on your matlab code it will uh save not only the code but also the outputs of the code and then it'll produce you can choose to produce it as a pdf right and then you can just merge the two pdfs uh so you can merge pdfs on a mac uh using um, the preview app, but I think you can do it in, in, in other ways as well. So. Okay. Um, well, thanks everybody. And you guys asked a bunch of great questions for Ben. Um, so, so I think that was really nice. Um, I see somebody asked one more question in chat. Um, oh, uh, sorry, Xavier. Yeah, I think your mic was not working. Um, but Xavier sent a link that he'd like us to take a look at. Oh, I see. This is, um, I think this is net metering information basically from the state of Nevada, which is of course a little bit different from the state of California, but dealing with similar kind of economic issues there. So. Okay, so I think we'll wrap up there. I'll let you guys go. And then we'll be back uh, in the classroom on, on Tuesday uh, to talk a little bit about buildings. <laughs>